Shabbat Shalom. It really is a honor to uh, welcome into conversation and this uh, Q&A that we're going to have at this point, Tara Romano, who is uh, the executive director of Pro-Choice NC. Uh, Tara, by way of introduction, just tell us a little bit about what Pro-Choice NC is uh, and maybe some of the background. Thank you so much for having me. So Pro-Choice North Carolina is a statewide um, advocacy organization. So we um, advocate for policies and conditions so that people can make the reproductive health care decisions that are best for them. So that includes um, preventing an unplanned pregnancy, uh, terminating a pregnancy if that's what they decide to do, or carrying a pregnancy safely to term. So we advocate for access to contraception, to abortion, to um, adequate health care, pre- and postnatal care, um, at, you know, affordable and accessible child care, things like paid leave, things, all the things that really support, truly do support people's reproductive health care decisions so that they can make the decision that is best for them and not because they feel like that's the only um, decision that they can make. And so that's the type of advocacy we do. And we do a lot of advocacy at the legislature, at the General Assembly, and then we also do um, grassroots advocacy, helping people to address the stigma that surrounds abortion in our reproductive health care. Um, and so we do that kind of advocacy. We've been in North Carolina since the late 1970s. We, until very recently, until last year, we had been as affiliated with a national organization, NARAL Pro-Choice America. So you may have known us as NARAL Pro-Choice North Carolina. Um, we, we are, we then, um, just, we changed that affiliation um, just last year, just to better be able to focus on the statewide uh, organization that organizing that we wanna do. And then of course the national organizations do their organizing at the federal level, at the national level. So we are still the same um, organization that you may have known us of as in the past, but we're now pro-choice North Carolina. Thank you so much for that. And, and, and for the work that you're doing, um, you know, I, 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 one of the questions is that a call went out not long ago for this particular Friday night, for this particular Shabbat, to be Repro Shabbat, I guess, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, an abbreviation of reproductive rights. You know, why is this a conversation that we're having right now? Uh, you know, uh, maybe take us into that. Well, we just, on January 22nd, um, commemorated the 49th anniversary of the landmark Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade, which was the decision that almost 50 years ago legalized abortion in every state in the country, because up until then it had been on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, so it was a really landmark decision. And what we're seeing right now at this moment is that we don't know that we are going to get to the 50th anniversary of that decision. So I think that that is why we are having this discussion right now. There is a case in front of the Supreme Court right now. Um, it's out of Mississippi. It's called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a direct challenge to the precedent set in Roe v. Wade. And we are anticipating that that decision is going to come later this year, possibly as late as June, but it could come anytime this spring. And with that decision, we are preparing to see a decision that either severely undermines the precedent set in row or overturns it altogether. So that I think is why maybe you all called to have this. And that's certainly why we're having these conversations now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there, I, I take it that there have been other cases and other precedents that have also been taking place on the national level, which have upheld Roe versus Wade over the years. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, Roe, Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973. Um, you had a 1992 case, KCV Planned Parenthood, um, mm -hmm. which was where you got the idea that you could states could restrict abortion, but it couldn't um, couldn't present an undue burden on the person seeking the abortion. That was a really vague. Um, it was a good willing to uphold Roe, but it also left these very sort of vague instructions to the states. And so what you've seen is like how there's now lots of restrictions at the state level, including ones that had been considered unconstitutional. So um, I do want to say like in 2020, there was a decision, um, Whole Women's Health v. Hellerstadt, it was out of Texas and it upheld the precedent set in row. And then in, oh, I'm sorry, that was 2016. And then in 2020, you had a similar case out of Louisiana, um, June v. Russo, that also upheld the precedent set in row. Um, and so you had so you had those cases that, that upheld that precedent. And really, the case that is before the Supreme Court right now, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, is um, 
the main difference is the people who are on the court between um, 2016 and, and 2021. Um, and so right now the Supreme Court has a, a supermajority, if you will, of anti-abortion justices. It's basically 6-3. Um, so what we're seeing now is like, in the past you had seen these, these state restrictions considered unconstitutional. And what is at stake in this Dobbs case is that um, they may go ahead and say, you know what, those cases aren't unconstitutional. Those restrictions are not unconstitutional. And again, it's gonna depend on what state you live in and what kind of access you have. It seems like there's a couple of potential outcomes. One outcome is that Roe versus Wade is overturned, but you said that there have been some uh, moments where uh, you know the, the strength of, of Roe uh, mm -hmm. has been has been has been uh, diminished. And mm -hmm. so the question is, what might happen in North Carolina uh, if you get one of these outcomes, either if it's overturned or mm -hmm. if it's severely limited? So if it is outright overturned, which it could happen, um, 26 states ha currently have something called a trigger law, which means that if Roe is overturned, abortion is immediately banned in those states. Now, North Carolina is not one of those states. We don't have a trigger ban. We also don't have any protections. Like there's states like California and New York, Massachusetts that have codified Roe into state law. So no matter what happens at Roe, they don't need those federal protections. So we don't have a trigger law, but we also don't have protections. Um, and so we will be a place where we might see states around us um, immediately ban abortion, like South Carolina, I think, is one of those states. And so we could see people coming to North Carolina to access care, um, certainly from our southeastern neighbors, um, if Roe is overturned. And also if Roe is not overturned, but severely weakened. And that means like the case at the heart of Dobbs out of Mississippi is a 15-week ban on abortion, which Roe, actually, that is not the precedent set in row. Um, the precedent set in row is basically not until like considered about what they call viability, which is usually around 20, 24 weeks. Um, so this is well before that. And so what you're seeing, and of course they have let the case in the six week ban in Texas take effect, which is, is already has undermined row. Like that actually without them making this decision that already undermines the precedent there. So you might, I think we're likely going to see, even if Roe is not outright overturned, states being given leeway to just pass a whole bunch of restrictions. And again, that might mean that we could see people come to North Carolina. Not that, because we don't currently have those kind of bans. Not that I don't think that that could happen with our legislature. We have a, um, a lot of anti-abortion lawmakers who haven't been able to pass anything since 2016 because of Governor Cooper's veto. Um, but we also have an election in 2022 where the entire General Assembly is up for re-election. Um, mm -hmm. And that could change if they could override his veto. And then we might see, start to see those kind of bans. So I don't see anything necessarily right away in terms of something, a major shift in abortion access in North Carolina, depending on the Supreme Court decision. But certainly it is something that will probably likely be coming. So Tara, you know, one of the things that, that you'll hear is um, that the movements among them, those who oppose, you know, you'll hear words like racism, you'll hear uh, feelings that are anti-women, we may call that uh, misogynistic. Uh, you'll even hear words like anti-Semitism coming mm -hmm. up. And again, that may be painting with a broad brushstroke, mm -hmm. but I was wondering if you could, uh, you know, contextualize this or speak about it for a few moments. Sure. I mean, this is something that isn't really new. Like you always, like you've got sort of the broader anti-abortion movement, but there certainly are elements within that movement of people who also subscribe to a lot of things around white supremacy, um, racial injustice. And like, for example, the um, the March for Life, that was the big anti-abortion march that they just had this past uh, weekend. Yeah, this past weekend in Washington, DC. Like one of the things that people were noticing was that there was a very vocal and visible white supremacist group that was part of, um, that march. And, you know, and they were connecting their opposition to abortion with what they believe around white supremacy. Like it wasn't just like they were there like, oh yeah, we also agree with this. Like they were connecting that um, controlling people's reproductive lives are key to how they believe um, that they will protect white supremacy. And so I think it's just helpful for people to understand like there's a lot that like it's often not as black and white as people want to think in terms of like you, why people might oppose or support abortion, um, particularly why people oppose abortion. Like there's a lot going on that also I think 
brings in how people feel about a whole lot of different other social justice issues, including like racism. Um, you mentioned like, you know, how they feel about gender equality, um, issues around like who, you know, economic injustice, like all of these things are really tied together and abortion, like I think it does the conversation such a disservice to really um, flatten it out the way we have, you know, there's a lot going on. And we also like will miss a lot of things that I think are quite dangerous. Um, when you see like a group like it was um, this white supremacist group that was joining in at the March for Life, like it's, you know, in the March for Life and like the power that they have, and then you're connecting them to what people thought were fringe groups, but then they're also connecting to groups that have some power, you know, and so it's dangerous for us to ignore uh, these kind of connections, um, just in an effort to sort of flatten out the narrative to make it seem, um, you know, less potentially dangerous than it actually is. Um. You know, so so if people are concerned about these issues, right? I mean, I you know, we are a congregation that will uh, lobby on on certain issues uh, to Congress. Uh, the Supreme Court can't be lobbied. Uh, you know, that's what uh, that's why cases are heard before the Supreme Court. Uh, but 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 what is it that uh, religious communities like ours, especially those involved in social justice and social action? What are the things that we can be uh, doing or thinking about or at least be involved with? I mean, I think one of the biggest things um, and the most direct thing is to be vocal in your support for abortion access and reproductive rights and help people like it really, I think the issue has been very flattened in our society um, by a lot of the way the media, the narrative is driven. And there's a lot of, there's just a lot more to it. There's a lot of uh, reasons why people support abortion access. Um, and I think we need to have people talk about that. It's extremely stigmatized. And that's really helped the anti-abortion restrictions be pushed through, right? If people aren't telling their stories about their, you know, their reproductive health care, their abortions, or people that they love, you know, if they're not standing up and saying, actually, I think it's okay that somebody makes this decision, like, it's just easier to push those restrictions through. And it's also, I think, helping people understand, like, this all, you know, people's decisions don't happen in a vacuum, right? They have, they have all kinds of reasons for making these decisions. And there's lots of ways that we can support people and how they make these decisions. And we should be calling or calling on Congress. Like we can't call on the Supreme Court, but we can call on our members of Congress. You know, the House has passed the Women's Health Protection Act, which would say that every state has to provide access to abortion no matter what the Supreme Court says, because the Supreme Court can't make that law. So the House has passed that, it's still in the Senate, and they're going to try and have a vote on it in the Senate. I think we should, you know, all call our senators um, to say that we expect them to pass that. And certainly it really is state by state how people can access abortion. So calling, getting, knowing who your lawmakers are, calling them up saying, look, I support access to abortion. I support access, access to the full range of reproductive health. And I expect you to um, consider that when you're taking these votes. You know, definitely make all those calls. Certainly pay attention to elections. Vote your whole ballot, including on our Supreme Court and our courts, state courts. Um, and then also if people want to directly support people who are accessing abortion, I mean, two things you can do are donate to an organization like the Carolina Abortion Fund, which helps people access pay for abortion care. Um, and then, uh, you know, people can also be clinic escorts, patient escorts. Um, there's a lot of protests at clinics happening all across North Carolina. And it's just nice to have a friendly face there to help people know how to, where, to get to the clinic to have a friendly face as they may ha have some protesters um, who are greeting them at those abortion clinics. So I think those are um, a lot of things like you can talk about it, call your lawmakers, um, and directly look at ways that you can support people who are trying to access abortion right now. Well, that's really helpful. You know, one of the things I, I remember hearing is, um, you know, again, this may take people by surprise, is just uh, the percentages of people who are supportive of access to mm -hmm. abortion. Uh, maybe you could speak on, you know, what you know, both uh, nationally as well as here mm -hmm. in North Carolina. I mean, the polls that we have, like, people have different feelings about abortion. They may have different feelings about, like, details around abortion access, but there is no state in the country where overturning Roe is the popular opinion, um, and that includes North Carolina. And so we had seen, I think it maybe was in 2019 or maybe even 2020, a national or a poll for North Carolina that showed that the strong majority of people, um, like, I can't remember if it was 70 or 75 percent, supported keeping Roe in place, supporting people that they have the right to access legal abortion. Um, and so we... 
there is a majority of people who support abortion access. And we need to, I think, just be much more vocal about that um, because people really do empathize with people in decision, you know, making decisions um, that are best for themselves. A lot of people really understand they don't want other people making those decisions for them and they can't do that for other people. There's a lot of empathy and compassion that I think kind of gets lost um, in the way the media, the narrative currently is around abortion access. Well, Tara Romano, I want to thank you for your time uh, this evening, for being with us. Uh, it just really helps us understand. And if people want to reach out, uh, again, they can access you on the internet or they can access yes. you through uh, Pro-Choice North Carolina. What, again, is the uh, uh, the website that they were going to work Yes, to? it is um, www.prochoicenc.org. So just go there. You'll find ways to contact us and lots of information on our website. So definitely, please be in touch. You can always sign up for our our newsletter, well, listserv as well, um, and stay in touch. There's, we're going to have lots of ways that people can take action. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and thanks again, and Shabbat Shalom. Oh, thank you.